Okay, so hello everyone. Okay, so let's cover first service, which is going to be EC2. But before we cover EC2, okay, let's have a look at some basic concepts regarding VPC. Okay, anyhow, we already know what is VPC and how we define our own portion of space regional level by defining VPC. And we define our own portion of space for our pre zone by defining submit. Okay, let's have a look at basic topology of VPC. So we select a region and we create our VPC. Okay, for example, let's say it's going to be VPC. Let's give a general name. Let's say it's going to be main network one. And you assign a network ID, main network ID. So for example, let's say you are going to assign a network ID as 10.0.0 slash system. So which IP address you can use here? You can use any IP address from class A, B, C. Okay, so is it public IP, private IP? It can be anything. Okay, whichever IP address you are going to assign for VPC and subnet, you are going to use those IP address for internal communication only. When you want to let communication take place outside VPC, means like via internet, so you assign another IP address to your instances, call it as public IP address. Okay, for example, let's say this is going to be Singapore region. Let's say you selected Singapore region and you created your VPC. Okay, so once you select your region, once you define VPC, then you go define subnet per availability zone. So for example, in Singapore, there are three availability zones. Let's say AJ1, AJ2, and three. Let's say this is all of the zone one, all of the zone two, and all of the zone three. Okay, per all of the zone, you define at least one subnet. Okay, for example, you can go to all of the zone and all of the sorry, all of the zone one, and you define your subnet. Let's say subnet one. Okay, take network addressing. Okay, by doing further subnetting from your main network. Let's say I can do ten zero one zero slash twenty four. I can go down up to zone two and define subnet two. Let's say it's going to be 10, 0, 2, 0, slash 24. Let's say you are not planning to place anything inside agent three, you no need to define subnet. If you want to place anything in agent three, so you can go define a subnet. And you say subnet three, 10, 0, 3, 0, slash 24. So you can define more than one subnet per hour to join. But anyhow, in detail about VPC, we go cover in VPC section separately. As of now, we are just having a look at basic VPC topology. Okay, so anytime you are creating server, so you can uh, specify where to place it. If you select subnet one, let's say you are creating some web server, let's say you are creating web one. If you select subnet one, your server placed in HZ one. Okay, for fault tolerant means to avoid single point of failure. So maybe plan to create another server in different hour of the zone. Okay, let's say maybe creating, let's say web two server. When you select subnet two, it's going to be placed in edge two. And similarly, if you are creating like a web three, you can place it in subnet three. So here, see here, you are running three servers. Okay, means even two hour of the zone fails, no problem, still your server is available. Okay, it's not about just a failure about all of the join. There may be issue with the underlying hardware of web servers you are running, maybe issue with your web operating system itself. Okay, for more fault tolerant purpose, so you can have multiple copy of server running. And as you see, you are running three servers here, they will be separately charged. Okay. Now, what about communication? Okay, so you can have more any server, you can have web server, you may have DB server, let's say DB1, you may have file server. Okay, like that. And all this server will get IP address automatically from your specific subnet. Let's say we have web one, so it can get IP address automatically from subnet one, like 10.0.1. something. Like <clears throat> for example, 10.0.1.10. .10. Either you let IP address automatically assign it to your servers, 
or you can manually assign let's say you want 10.0.100 as IP address for web one you can assign okay and let's say so let's say for example let's say 10.0.1.100 let's say web 2 10.0.2.10 like that you can assign either manually or automatically okay these ip addresses will be used for internal communication only let's say web1 want to ping with web2 so web1 can communicate web2 by using internal 10.0 series ip address okay from web1 to web2 from 10.0.1.100 to 10.0.2.10 like that okay but whenever your web server want to access internet maybe you want to access your web servers via internet your server need to have public ip address so you have to separately purchase public ip address Okay, let's say maybe public IP address is going to be x dot x dot x dot x something. Okay, that public IP address can be used by your customer who are going to access this server via internet. Okay, and by default, there is communication between all these subnets. Okay, because at the border of VPC, there is the VPC router city. We say this one as VPC router. At the border of VPC, a VPC router will be sitting. As soon as you create VPC, a VPC router will be created. So this VPC router having linked towards all your subnets. So think this is the VPC router connected to three LANs. Okay, which are those LANs? Subnet one is a LAN which exists in AZ1. Subnet two is another VLAN, sorry, another LAN which exists in AZ2. And subnet three is another LAN which sits inside AZ3. Okay, so because of this VPC router, we have communication uh, ability means reachability between all the subnets. And this VPC router is completely managed by AWS. You don't need to manage anything about VPC router. When you go to VPC console, you don't see that VPC router, but it exists and it's there and completely managed by AWS. As soon as you add another subnet, another link will be created. Let's say, for example, if you go to AJ3, let's say you create subnet four. Let's say you assign network ID as 10.0.4.0 slash 24. Okay, VPC router automatically create another LAN link towards that subnet 4. So whenever subnet 4 want to reach to subnet 1, so communication will take place via that VPC router. Okay, so think this VPC is like pure private network, a pure private data center which exists in Singapore region. And it does not have connectivity to internet. Okay, now it's time to provide connectivity to internet. Okay, so to provide internet connectivity, so we create internet gateway. We create a router called as internet gateway. So whenever you say to create internet gateway, by default, it connected to internet. Means that local ISP, whichever ISP available near to Singapore region. Okay, as a customer, we also connected to internet from any location. And what we do, we attach internet gateway to our VPC. Okay, actually internet gateway attached to that VPC router, but when you are working in VPC, actually you see like you are attaching internet gateway to that VPC only. Okay, there is nothing involved like regarding management regarding VPC router. Okay, this internet gateway is providing just internet physical connectivity. And this internet gateway device is managed by AWS only. Okay, so coming to VPC router, internet gateway, you no need to worry about underlying hardware failure because whatever underlying hardware is then it's spanned across multiple availability zones. Let's say here we have three availability zones. Let's say two availability zones fail, that's not going to make impact on VPC router and internet gateway. Okay, anyhow, we just create internet gateway, we attach to VPC, that is just physical connectivity towards internet. But we need to define routes. Okay, routes means we need to tell how to reach internet. We need to tell you can reach internet via internet gateway. So usually we manipulate routing okay, entries in router, but we cannot manage this internet gateway okay, and we, because we have zero access to it. We just create it, we attach to our VPC. But how you are going to tune routing table? We create routing table separately and we attach that routing table to specific subnet. Okay, so whenever you create routing table, okay, by default, there will be local network entry. So what is our local network entry? 10 0 0 slash system 10 0 0 slash system that represents local okay so 
RT. So anytime you create routing table, it includes local network entry. So we are representing our main network that represents all your circuits. Okay, so now, so ISP side, there is many networks, internet side, many networks. So how you can configure when you don't know what are specific destination network in routing table, we make use of static default route. Okay, so to, to tell to these subnets, how can they reach internet via internet gateway? So we go add static default route. We say to reach this network, zero 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 slash zero via internet gateway what we are saying is to reach this network zero dot zero dot zero dot zero what that means that means any ip address and slash zero that represents any subnet mask so as we don't know what the network exists ISP side we say to reach any other network except local network which is 10 zero zero we say go via internet gateway and now this routing table available to all your subnets. Let's say we ever want to reach a 10.0.2.100, which exists in subnet 2. So routing table says it's your local network only, okay, which is within your VPC only. Okay, let's say maybe um, our web one want to reach Google server. Let's say Google server on internet may be having IP address 8.8.8. .8 so whenever web server says I want to reach 8.8.8, .8 so what routing table say? 8.8.8 .8 is not your local network because your local network is 10.0.0 slash system. So 8.8.8, .8 that is some other network that can be reachable via internet gate. Okay, so this is how a basic VPC topology exists. We have VPC, we have subnet for our up to zone. At border of VPC, we have VPC router. VPC router makes sure, okay, enables communication between all the subnets within VPC to access internet we make use of internet gateway. You can create many VPCs. Okay, by default, you are allowed to create five VPCs by default limitation per region, but you can create more than five VPCs. You just need to send a request to AWS. No, CDN will come up. See, our up to zone is different. Edge location is different. No, sir. You told me about edge location. Mm. Like website is there. Mm. That uh, case should be there. Like that will be CDN facility is different facility. It's different from our up to zone. Okay. Don't worry. You will understand when you go to CDN top. Within region, our up to zone is the different facility where you place your web servers, DB servers, file servers, mail servers, etc. And there is another facility called as edge location. Edge location is dedicated for CDN. Okay, anyhow, when you create AWS account, by default, if there is a default VPC defined in every region, which contains a VPC and also contains subnet, like one subnet per hour up to zone, and also internet gateway, and also updated routing table. You can go with your default VPC or you can go with your custom VPC. When you want to go with your custom VPC, when you want like a, some specific network ID, okay, means your own, you maybe want to specify your own network ID like 10, 0, 0, 11, 0, 0, something. So let's log into AWS management console. Sir, I have some queries. Yeah. Uh, related to this. Uh, so one thing is, uh, you said VPC router is not in our control, mm. all right? So uh, whenever we create a subnet, right? Uh, if, uh, uh, and uh, how do we choose a uh, default route? Means default route, what I have seen is if you deploy an image, right? Uh, there is a DSCP server through which it gets an IP and uh, and it, uh, whatever dot 254, 254 or uh, dot one would be the gateway to it. Mm. right so this automatically get assigned to the vpc router yeah right actually say the vpc router will have first valid ip address from each subnet like from subnet one so mm -hmm. we have landing uh, landing going towards subnet one right so mm -hmm. here the network id we have 10.0.1.0 so from this first valid ip address will be 10.0.1.1 so the 10.0.1.1 will be assigned to this vpc router like link going towards LAN2, which is subnet to first valid IP address 10.0.2.1. So this VPC router assigned with 2.1 IP address. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah.
Okay. So other question which I have was related to the, so uh, uh, now internet gateway, you said uh, by default, it does not have an internet access. All the machine does not have an internet access. If you want to have an internet access, you need to uh, put a route to a internet gateway thing, right? Yeah. So do, uh, but I have seen when you deploy the image, internet from machine to internet is access is allowed. So is that by default or is that you configure it? Yeah, that may be default way PC are working. Okay. Can you like submit one? Coming in. Uh, BPC one, submit one, BPC two, submit two, BPC submit two, like that. For what? For example, there is a like a one you have a PC and you have subnet. Yeah, and I want to do like for example PC, mm. You can use. Uh, one more thing. Uh, like, uh, in subnet on web page, mm. it is a copy mode. Web online web two or on copy server. Yeah, you may be there may be same copy of servers or different copy of servers. Okay, so if uh, one part of the server is web one. And one part of uh, code is in web two. You can. Uh, that's up can to work you. In tandem. That's up to you. How you are hosting your service. Okay. So next, go to AWS Management Console. Okay, so for example, let me select like North Virginia region. Okay, so if you go have a look at VPC, so we go to networking section. Okay, we go to VPC. Okay, there we can say define VPC as I need to be the network ID as 172.31.0.0.16. So let's look at Singapore region. Okay, there have some VPC, that's custom VPC. Okay, let me delete that VPC. Okay, right now I don't have any VPCs in Singapore region. So as I do not have any VPCs, so I cannot create any server in Singapore region. Okay, anytime, okay, you want to create default VPC, you can go to the actions and you can say create default VPC. Or you just created accounts and you go to any region so you can see a default VPC. So default VPC by default available until you delete it manually. So when you create a default VPC, so it's going to create everything as we mentioned in this topology. So click on close. We see we have a VPC network ID is 172.31.0.0 slash system. And when we go to the subnets, there we see three subnets because in Singapore there are three developed zones. We see subnet as 172.31.0.0 slash 20 and 172.31.16.0 slash 20 and 172.31.32.0 slash 20. And you can also see internet gateway. So this is the internet gate we attached to this VPC. And if you look at the route tables, there is a route table. And if you look at the routes, and you can see a local network entry, 172.31.0.0 slash system, and a static default route. Okay, that says to reach any other network except local network, you can go via the IGW internet gateway. Okay, if you are okay with your default VPC, you can go. Okay, this is VPC providing internet access. Okay, so if you want to create your custom VPC, you can. Okay, you can you keep the default VPC and can create a custom VPC, or you can create the default VPC and you can go with your custom VPC. So what I do, let me delete this default VPC. I go with my custom VPC. So I acknowledge that I want to delete the default VPC. So let's create our own custom VPC. So let's provide a name tag. So it's a main network one. 
So give whatever choice your name and IPv4 block. I go with a 10 0 0 slash system. If you want to assign IPv6, you can go with IPv6. Okay, then we go with the tenancy as default, then create. Then we go to subnets, then we create subnet. Let's say name tag as subnet one in VPC main network one. And we place it in our application zone one. So there we see three application zones, one A, one B, one C. Or you can call them as like AJ2, AJ1, or AJ2. So I select one A, and let's assign network ID as 10, 0, 1, 0, slash 24. Great. This says submit does not exist. Let's go back. Main network one. We are saying subnet one this is 10 0 1 0 slash 24. Great. Okay, that was some API. That's it. Let's close it. Now let's create another subnet. Let's subnet two. And we select VPC main network one. The network ID is going to be 10 0 2 0 slash 24. I place a submit two in again in one name only. So let me just delete and recreate. Okay, let's create submit again. Submit two. The PC is main network one. Our up to join is one B. The network ID is ten zero two zero slash two. Let's create again subnet three main network one and our up zone is one C and network ID as ten zero three zero slash twenty four. Okay, done. So now we have three subnets. So one subnet per one our up zone one A one B and one C. So now let's go define internet gateway. Let's say it's going to be IG of main network one. Say this is the internet gateway we are going to attach to our VPC, which is main network one. We create and we attach it to our VPC. We say attach to VPC and select VPC and attach. So done. So next we go to routing table. So you can create new routing table or you can just update existing routing table. So I go with the existing routing table and we look at routes and we click on edit routes. So by default, it's having local network entry. It says 10 0 0 slash system is local. Let's go add static default route. So we say to reach this network, so we're not specifying any IP address. That means any IP address having any subnet mask and we say go via internet gateway. So we go select that IG main network one and save routes. That's it. So we have created VPC with internet reachability. So now what we do, so we can launch instances and we can place in our subnets. So what I do, let me go to compute section. There we have EC2 service. So click on EC2. Uh, sir, one query on that route thing. So uh, you have created a route which goes to an internet. Uh, you selected that uh, for internet access, you select uh, this VPC should connect to this internet gateway, right? Yeah. But, uh, but we haven't decided if uh, how uh, 10 dot 1 dot 10 from one availability zone to other availability zone, uh, what level of access you can. Uh, uh, see, when you want, when you talk about communication between subnets within VPC, communication mm -hmm. will take via the VPC data. They no need to touch internet gateway. Okay. So you're saying by default, it is all allowed. Yes. Like let's say in this case, web one want to communicate web two, mm -hmm. like traffic flow will be like this. Traffic will go initially from web one to VPC router and VPC router to web two machine. Okay. 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 The machines will make use of internet gateway only when they want to access outside of VPC, like they want to access like google.com or some servers. 
and uh, so if we want to restrict this communication can we do that do we have a privilege we can do that we have virtual firewalls okay like security groups acl we see about them in vpc section all, all right all right okay. thank you okay so right now we are in ec2 section so ec2 is a fundamental service provided by aws cloud where you launch your virtual servers in the cloud okay so right now we see we have zero running instance okay you can launch instance so what is instance it is a virtual server okay when you launch a virtual server so mostly so your virtual server running on gen hypervisor that managed by aws so we go with launch instance so first thing we need to select what operating system we want so aws provides operating system source in the form of ami a major machine image okay so you can run like windows linux bsd palo alto okay and a file load balancer csr router many kind of softwares you can select from game so you can look at aws marketplace to find out which softwares are available okay we'll see about aws marketplace in few moments so here we can see from quick start we can see different operating system like amazon linux 2 amazon linux 1 so as we know linux is open source so Amazon took that open source and developed it as an enterprise Linux operating system. So these are Amazon Linux. And you can scroll down so you can see like SUSE, Ubuntu, deep learning, okay, deep learning, application running on Amazon Linux. And we can see Microsoft Windows Server 2019 base OS. We see Windows, Microsoft Windows Server 2019 with contents. Okay, this OS comes with operating system and pre-installed containers. Like we will look at like Microsoft Windows Server 2019 with SQL Server 2017 standard. This means this one comes with the operating system plus pre-installed SQL Server. So AMI may include only pure operating system or it may include pre-installed application. That means you no need to install that application later. Or you can log in once you log in on your server, you install whatever thing you want. You can uninstall whatever thing you want. Okay, so we can select Windows Server 2016. Okay, what I do, let me select Microsoft Windows Server 2016 base operating system. This AMA is going to provide only Windows OS. Okay, now we selected operating system by selecting choice of AMA. Now we are going to choose an instance type. You get the server like T2 Nano that comes with one CPU code and 0.5 GB RAM. And we see T2 Micro, one CPU code like one GB RAM. So if we scroll down so you can see different type of instances, like you say M5 to X Lodge, which is general purpose server, eight CPU cores, 32 GB RAM, and storage is EBS. EBS thing is like hard disk. And we have, is EBS optimized? Means is it going to provide good performance for EBS and network performance, like up to 10 Gbps? And is it supports IPv6? Okay, anyhow, most modern operating system supports IPv6. So you can see nano, micro, medium, very extra large server as well, as you scroll down. So you can see like some memory optimized server. That means server with more memory, which is Z1D to 12X large, coming with 48 CPU cores and 384 GB RAM. And we have two into 900 SSD. Okay, this represents, there are two SSD hard disk with a capacity of 900 GB, each one directly attached. And okay, then we have is it EBS optimizer means is it providing good EBS performance means storage performance and network performance. We see exact 25 Gbps. Okay, based on your workload, okay, select choice of your EC2 instance, like one general purpose, like one some good memory. We can go with like T2 to X bar, which provides 32 GB memory. No, if that is not sufficient for you, you can go with any other instance. Let's say your application requires a lot of computing power, I means CPU power. You can go for computer optimized instance, like computer optimized. We see, comes with a different hardware capability. Now your application requires a lot of memory, means a lot of RAM, so you can go for memory optimized. Now your application requires like a lot of graphical processing. You can go with like GPU instances, okay, which come okay, which comes with the processor which are actually designed for parallel processing. Okay, so in this case, I go with the T2 medium for Windows Server. You can launch it on T2 Micro, that's also fine. 
see which falls under free time. So let's click on next. Okay, now we selected AMI and we selected an instance type. Now it's asking how many instances you are going to launch. One, two, three, five. So I go with yeah. Okay. And we select the VPC in which VPC we are going to place. Let's say it's going to main network one. And it's asking in which subnet you are going to place. Let's say I select subnet one. That means this instance will be placed in 1A envelope zone. And if you want to automatically assign a public IP address, you can go say enable or you can assign public IP address manually like that. And if you want to join your machine to some AD domain, you can select if you have created a domain in using AWS service. And we have something I am role we can attach to this EC2 instance. We talk about I am role when we go to security section in I am talking. And we have shutdown behavior. We have stop option, terminate option. Okay, once instance launched in this Singapore region, how we are going to log on to that server? Remotely. In case Windows, we make use of RDP protocol. In case Linux or some firewall device, some router device, we are going to make use of SSH protocol. So this is about once you log in remotely, what to do with your server? If you give shutdown command to your server, stop, shut down the server, terminate, terminate means deleting that server. So usually what we select, we select stop. Why you should why you want to terminate server by giving shutdown command? If you want to terminate, then you do it manually, right? So we go with shutdown behavior as stop. And by default, this basic monitoring turned on. Okay, if you want to turn on and answer the monitoring for this server, we can enable this feature. Okay, anyhow, about monitoring, we have a separate section, cloud watchdog. Okay, then we have some tenancy. There are three tenancies: shared tenancy, dedicated tenancy and dedicated host tenancy. This specifies where your server running, in dedicated hardware or on shared hardware. Okay, for now I go with shared tenancy. I will explain about this tenancy in detail in few minutes. If you want to add some additional graphics card, you can go with add graphics card, like EG1 medium, okay, EG1 large, we can see which comes with different graphics card. Okay, and this instance is going to have a network card, which is Ethernet Zero. Okay, if you want to add additional Ethernet cards, you can add now or you can add later on. And by default, it's going to get IP address automatically, okay, from your subnet. If you want to assign a specific IP address like 10.0.1.100, you can assign it. Okay, then we have next section, user data. Okay, let's say you want to pass some script to that EC2 instance. You can give script here. Like for Windows, you can give like a PowerShell script, DOS script, or bad script. Okay, the script will be executed on that instance once instance finishes booting. Like if it is a Windows, sorry, Linux machine, you can give script like a Bash shell script or Python script, Ruby script, like that. Okay, we go with the next option. So it's about so, sliding storage. So, so it's about so uh, i i sorry i did not understand the purpose of that shutdown so when it is used on what is the purpose now it means let's say you did a remote access to server okay let's mm -hmm. say we created windows server and you made remote access to this windows server let's okay. say you may give shutdown instruction from remote window okay so then what to do with your server just shut down the server or delete the server so that represented by this shutdown option. Okay, so it means you remotely access the server, and then you, if you give a uh, if you give a shutdown, it will automatically shut down. Yes, that's what. So you stop think. means it will just shut down your Windows server. If you say terminate, mm -hmm. as soon as you give shutdown instruction from your remote window, the mm -hmm. EC2 instance will be terminated. It means deleted. Okay, okay, got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay, so next we add the storage. That's the EBS storage. Think it's like hard disk for your server. So by default, it's adding first EBS volume, means first hard disk, called as root device or root EBS volume. So root EBS volume is the first hard disk attached to your server, where your operating system exists. And we see for Windows, it's taking a default EBS root volume, about size about 30 GB. Okay, if you want to increase the size, you can increase, or if you want to add additional EBS volume, you can add now, or you can add later. And here we have volume types, IOPS. This represents different type of EBS volumes and different type of 
car formats. Okay, anyhow about EBS, we have a separate section. So let's go to the default settings. Let's add a tag. So you can add the tags. Like click on add tags. You can select a name. You can give the name. Let's say this is something Microsoft Web Server. So anytime you create resource in clouds, it's better to tag them. So tags are general identities. Okay, by looking at the tags, so you can identify what server is that. Because every resource you create, it will be having a unique ID. Okay, this composite of numbers and alphabets. So anytime you look at the resource, it may be difficult to identify what server is that, why you create it. Okay, to easily identify the resources for what purpose you have created, you go with tag option. So I go with name tag, like name, and you can add different type of tags, like you can say uh, which department. Okay, let's say the server is designated for some department, let's say web marketing. Okay, maybe that's a marketing web server. And you can add the tag like T team. Okay, that means a technical team. So T team maybe let's say team 99. Okay, means who manages technical things on that server? Okay, like web service tuning, uploading web data, something. Like that, you can add multiple tags. Okay, up to 50 tags you can add. Once done, we go with configure security group. So security group is a virtual firewall per instance. Okay, we know we are running Windows Server. Internally, we will have a Windows firewall. If it is Linux, internally it will have like IAP tables, AC Linux. Okay, that's separate. Apart from that, we have a virtual firewall called a security group provided by AWS. So you can protect your instance with AWS firewall. Means AWS virtual firewall called a security group. Okay, it's creating a security group with the name of launch which are one, or you can give your own name and it's by following RD, the minimum access RD. So means we can do remote access on that server. If you want to add additional rule, you can add now or later on. Okay, if you want to give some name, let's say this is going to be Microsoft Web Server Security Group. Then click on review and launch. And here we do something, create a key pair. I go with create a new key pair. And let's give some name. Let's say it's going to be MS Web. Then what I do, I click on download key pair. There is a key downloaded. I will explain what is this key pair in a moment. And launch instance. And let's click on view instances. Okay, there is a name tag as MS Web Server. Okay, now let's see what is this key pair. Okay, let's assume you may be installing a Windows Server operating system. Let's say this is maybe a system. Maybe let's say it is your local machine, maybe laptop, your server. Okay, so let's say you maybe want to install a Windows Server OS on that. What you do, you put your DVD. Okay, or you put your pen drive. Within that, you have Windows Server operating system. So you put DVD and boot, you finish the installation. Once installation finishes in Windows Server operating system, so it comes by default with a username called as administrator. Each Windows Server operating system will come with a default username called as administrator. Okay. So before you log on onto that server, you need to set the password. Right? You need to set the password. Without setting password, you cannot log on onto that server. Even direct login or remote login, like using RDP protocol. But where we are launching server in remote location in Singapore region. Operating system finishes booting. There will be a default username called as administrator. But how we are going to set the password? We have no direct access because we are not sitting directly in front of the server. Where we are, we are sitting remotely. Okay, we cannot set password remotely here. Okay, we require a method that can be used to set the password. So who sets this password? EC2 service will set a random password. Once that Windows Server finishes booting, EC2 service come into play and it's going to set a random default password. Now we need to download that password, right? 
we are going to download that password but how you are going to download that password via internet we should not download that password in clear test format so which method can we follow to transmit secure information encryption okay so let ec2 service encrypt the password and we download encrypted password and we decrypt it so for that purpose we are creating key pair for that purpose we are creating key pair so in my case i created a key that's called as ms1 i said create a key pair with the name of ms1 in this key pair it's like pk public key infrastructure it's going to create two keys one is public key and another one is private key in pk public key used for encryption and private key used for decryption okay when we created key pair whichever key downloaded within my local machine which is ms web that is private key see rsa private key so this private key can be used to decrypt the data and the public key can be used to encrypt the data so public key is stored in ec2 console if you go to ec2 console and we look at key pairs here it is the ms key that we created so this is public key so what ec2 service will do it will set a random password for this window server and it will encrypt the password with the public key which is stored in ec2 console and we download that encrypted password and we decrypt it using private key once you get the default password once you log in you can change the password or you can create different user accounts different passwords and you can allow them remote access okay so here let's go to our ec2 console and we go to instances and there we have ms web server and we see the ip address we see we have private ip address all of us from subnet one which is 10 0 1 2 1 9 and here we have public ip address okay so now let's log on to the windows server so how we are going to access that windows server via internet so to access server via internet so we require public ip address of that server so let's copy public ip address of the windows server and let's open remote desktop connection okay rdp client tool from this windows machine and we paste ip address enter on windows server default username is administrator and we need to get the password to get the password we go to the windows server we go to actions and we say get windows password and it asks him provide private key to decrypt the password we say choose the file And let's select that ms web okay this is the key open they type the password okay here it is the password let's copy it and we already the client window so let's paste the password so it's showing its identity and say yes As we're making initial login, it just setting user profile. Okay, there it is. So right now we are remotely connected to a Windows server that's running in Singapore region. Okay, if you are a Windows administrator, so carry out your daily administrative tasks or just provide these credentials like IP address, username, password to particular Windows team or developer application team who wants to work on this Windows server. Okay, if you have a look at the server properties, go to system properties, and we see it's a Windows Server 2016 Data Center Edition operating system, and we see processor is 2.30 gigahertz, and installer RAM is 4 GB, and we see Windows activation is activated, the license. Okay, similarly, if you want to launch a Linux machine, you can launch let's minimize it let's go to instance and we'll launch instance let me select red hat enterprise linux 8 and instance type let it is t2 micro next instance details number of servers one vpc main network one select any subnet let's say one subnet two you can select subnet two okay if you want to manually send public ip address you can skip that step 
then go with the rest of the default settings. Okay, root volume means first hard disk about 10 GB. You can increase the size. Next, add the tags, then configure security group. So it's going to create a security group, which is going to allow SSH traffic by default. Okay, let me review and launch. And you can select any existing key pair or you can go create a new key pair. I go with create new key pair. Let's say this is Rx. Red Hat Web Server. So click on download key pair. There is a key downloaded. A launch instance. Okay, sometimes we get this AP error. Okay, let me just refresh. Red hat. So we said Tito Micro. Okay, I select a subnet to then nest, nest attacks, security groups. Okay, review and launch, launch. And I will say select the existing key pair, which is we just created RH web and acknowledge that I have that key pair launch instance. So view instances. Okay, I did not give any tags, so that's why I didn't see any name tag. You can give here. So let's say it's going to be RH web server or file server, TV server, or some CRM application server or analytics server, anything. Okay, so now we understood what is the purpose of key pair in case of Windows machine. So we use key pair to decrypt the default password. Okay. So already we did login. So if you want to change the password, you can change. Just go to computer management. Like right click PC, we go to the manage. We go to users and groups. Okay, it's going to launch server manager console. Or you can just launch computer management directly from command prompt run pro. You can say coompmgmt.msc. We go to the local users and groups. We go to the users, the user administrator we can set custom password. So go with proceed, let's set a custom password. The password has been set. So next time you log in, so you no need to use that random password. Random password is not going to work. Sir, I have a query, couple of, so one is, uh, if you change the password, right? So now that key becomes invalid, correct? Which from which we were uh, accessing it earlier. Hello. A couple of questions. One is related to when you have changed the password of the machine, right? Mm -hmm. So now that key which you have downloaded is not no more valid, right? So I yeah. cannot use that key for accessing it. Yes, right? the old password is not valid. That, that password is not valid. So mm -hmm. in case I lost the password, what mm -hmm. is the mechanism to recover it? Uh, there is a troubleshooting method. I will explain later on. All right. And other thing is related to access. So right now we are accessing every machine through the public IP through remotely basically, right? Yes. Now, if in case I don't want to use the public IP, is mm -hmm. there other way to access this machine? If you set VPN between VPC and your on permits, you can access it using private IP address. Okay. So, yeah. so uh, that's why a VPN you can communicate using a private IP address, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so if I connect a VPN connection to my uh, office network and then I ex am able to ping you the yeah, I like if you have a VPN connection between VPC to your office network, mm -hmm. you can communicate using private IP address. Good. And and the third, third, third part of my question is basically now you have deployed the image. Uh, so mm. how do I know how much it is charging? Uh, how, what is the cost of this machine? I will explain in a moment. Okay, sure. Thank you. Okay, so you understood the what is purpose of keep it in case of Windows operating system and purpose of keep it when you are launching a Linux machine or any firewall or rotor device will be different. Okay, so in case Linux or firewall rotor device, when you are launching in situ instance, we still create a key pin. Okay, okay, so whenever you want to access like a Linux machine or some kind of network device. Okay, like a router or firewall, like load balancer. So usually you are going to access them using SSH protocol. Windows to remotely access that you usually use RDP protocol. When you are going to log on to Linux and router firewall, you are going to make use of SSH. Why SSH is secure, which provides secure term instead of using telnet. So you make use of SSH. When we talk about SSH authentication, so how your SSH service is going to authenticate users? using two methods. Method one, like username and password, means the SSH service on your server can be configured to authenticate SSH login using username and password. And the method two, using username and key-based authentication. Which key is going to be private key? Second method is, username and key all AMIs like Linux AMIs window sorry I like firewall AMIs router AMIs which is available from AWS marketplace they are pre-configured to authenticate using method 2 using username and key. <coughs> okay username may be easy to iPhone user or maybe admin okay that depends on what, what you are going to access like you are going to access like Red Hat Linux, CentOS Linux, mostly username will be easy to have a user. Let's say maybe you are going to access some kind of routers or firewalls. The username may be easy to have a user or username may, may be admin. What username to use that we can find out when you go to AWS Marketplace and you see details about particular AMI. Let's say you can go to AWS Marketplace, you can open like FI load balancer. So that shows what default username. You can go select CentOS, that shows what is the default username. You can go select like follow all the firewall, that shows what is the default username to log in. So as I did launch in Linux, which is Red Hat Linux, it's going to make use of ec 2 user user as username, and we make use of downloaded private key. And where is the relative public key? It's an EC2 console and also available to that Red Hat machine. Okay, so we go to EC2 console, and let's go get public IP address of our Red Hat machine. But we see we didn't assign public IP address. So we go assign it manually. So we go to Elastic IPs and we purchase a public IP address, allocate, close, and we select this public IP address and we associate with our Red Hat machine. We go select the Red Hat machine, which is RH web server and its relative private IP address and associate. Now we have public IP address for Linux machine. So we go to the instance, select RH web server, and let's get public IP address. Okay, so in Windows by default, we do not have any SSH client tool. So we can download and install party tool to make SSH connectivity to that Linux machine. Okay, so we can go here, like we can provide username as ec 2 user at the public IP address. And next, as part of the authentication, we need to go select the private key, which is RHWeb. But we see the file format. If you look at RHWeb, the downloaded file, the file format is .pm. But PuTTY does not support that format. PuTTY supports .ppk format. We need to convert this .pm format to .ppk. Okay, for that we can make use of a tool called as PuTTY gem. Okay, 
Partisan. You can download Party and Partisan tool from Party.org site. You just go to Party.org. Click on. You can download Party here. So you can download Party here, like for Windows 32-bit package or 64-bit package. In same page, you can also find Partisan. Here it is. You can download Partisan package. So Partisan is a tool can be used to generate own key pages. You can also use Partisan tool to change the key format. Okay. So what I do, I'm going to make use of Partisan tool to change that key, which we have that rhweb.pm to .ppk. I just load that key in Partisan tool and save it back. That's it. So I open that Partisan just load the key which is rh-web.pm it's trying to find out dot ppk file i say go for look for all files i just click on say all files let's look for that file which is rh-web here it is open and just save private key say yes you can give different name let's say it's going to be prh web so i'm just giving a different name here okay prh web and click on save now. that's it now we go to our party console we provided all the username ec 2 a user at public ip address and we go to ssh under connection section authentication we load that prh web the dot ppk file here it is open open so showing its identity, we trust it, we say yes. Now we connect it using a username, ec 2 hyphen user. This user can run administrative commands by appending sudo before command, or he can switch to root account. Just say sudo switch user. That's it, he connected to root account. If you are a Linux admin, or your application or developer, or somebody you want to carry out your administrative task on your Linux machine, carry out. Otherwise, hand over this credential to particular team. Okay, for example, let's install something. Okay, anyhow, before you put any service in your server, it's better to update it, like patch. Like in Linux, you can use yum tool to install or update or remove something. You can say yumy update, which is going to patch your server. Okay, I'm not going to update because it's going to take the time, okay, as it is not a production server. Let me simply install a web service. I just say yumy install httpd. That's Apache service, which provides web service where you can run HTTP site or HTTPS site. Let me just start that Apache service. I say service HTTPD start. Let's say, can we able to access the default page provided by Apache server? So what I do, let's copy public IP address and let's open a browser. It says not reachable. Why? Because there is a security group which is restricting HTTP traffic. Let's see which security group we attached to our RH server. So we just go to description and we just scroll down. Right side, right? Yeah. Security group, which is launch wizard one. So we select that one. We see outbound, everything is permitted. And when we go to inbound, it's allowing only SSH. It's not allowing HTTP. Let's allow HTTP. So we click on edit and we add a rule in that virtual firewall, which is security group. We say allow HTTP from any source and save it. Now let's go back to browser. Enter. So we see the default index page provided by Apache. Okay, so that's how you launch EC2 instance. Okay, so similar procedure you can follow to launch other servers. 
like SUSE Linux or any firewall device, router device, many things. Okay, now let's go to the theory. Let's open AC2 section. Okay, we understood what is AMI. Okay, so AMI is a Amazon machine image. Okay, let me just open different side, different PPT. Okay, so now we understood EC2. So EC2 is AWS offering of the most fundamental piece of cloud computing that allows you to create a virtual private server in the cloud. Okay, we call them as EC2 instances. So these instances can run most Linux, BSD, Windows operating system. Behind scene, AWS make users of Gen Hypervisor for virtualization purpose. Okay, there are virtualization type like EXXI from VMware. Okay, Hyper-V from Microsoft. Gen Hypervisor is open source. Okay, AWS actually does sponsorship to open source projects and also take advantages of developer open source things. And EC2 provides rechargeable compute capacity in the clouds. Anytime you want to scale up or scale down the server, you can do it. Okay, as we go with our EC2 section, we see the procedure, how you can scale up, scale down your servers. Understanding AMI. So by now you know what is AMI. It's an Amazon machine image provides the information required to launch an instance. What is instance? A private server, means virtual server in the cloud. So AMI includes a template for the root volume, means it automatically going to select first hard disk. Okay, and AMI include only operating system or may include pre-installed application. Like for example, AMI includes an OS only or OS plus an application server pre-installed, like MS SQL container like that. EMI comes in both public and private flavors. Access to MI is either freely available, like shared MIs, community MIs, or bought and sold in the AWS marketplace. Okay, you find MIs like uh, sold by many vendors like Microsoft, okay, CentOS, Red Hat, okay, and uh, software sold by many other companies as well. So many operating system vendors publish ready to use base MIs. You select MI to use based on following characteristics, is that AMI available in region and select AMI based on which OS you want and select the one 32 bit OS, 64 bit OS. And based on launch permission and storage for the root device. So whenever you say root device, think the first hard disk for your server where your operating system application will be running. Your AMI may provide a root device as EBS instance store. Think it's like normal hard disk. Your data will be there even you shut down EC2 instance. EC2 instance store. Think it's like temporary hard disk. If you shut down instance, you lose the data. But if you reboot, you don't lose the data. Either your server comes with the EBS instance store or EC2 instance store, that depends on AIM. If your server coming with EC2 instance store, that's temporary hard disk, but faster than normal EBS hard disk. Before you shut down machine, you copy data from that instance store to EBS store. It will represent as a temporary storage when you look at the disk management control. So now let's have a look at AWS Marketplace. So we say Google and we say AWS Marketplace. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so from this place, you get information regarding available softwares and related pricing. And also you find hardware related pricing as well. So AWS Marketplace provides different category softwares, only OS, security softwares, networking, storage, data products, machine learning, DevOps, data analytics. Let's open like security, operating system, Okay, let me just swap it. Like operating system, see Microsoft Windows Server 2019. Okay, base operating system, system base operating system, that means only OS. Even you can filter like software is provided by Amazon Web Services, provided by Clockwork Limited, provided by Cognosis, like Frontline. So if you select software, that is a for example Windows Server 2019. We see product overview and highlights about that product. And if you scroll down, and pricing slightly varies from region to region. So you can select the region. So, for example, if you look at North Virginia region and coming to software pricing, this is zero dollar for, for that Windows Server 2019 OS. So we know anyhow, Microsoft Server is not open source, it's commercial operating system. Why they are offering free up cost? because AWS purchased volume-based license, okay, from Microsoft. That's why they are providing free of cost. And estimated infrastructure costs about 0.38 cents, okay, for easy to per hour basis. But actual pricing you can see here. If you are running Microsoft Windows Server 2019 base on P1 micro server, which comes with 613 MB RAM, price is 0.02 cents per hour. Now, if you run on T2 small, which comes with two GB RAM, one CPU core, price it 0 0.03 cents. See, this representing only EC2 price, means instance price. There will be additional price, like you attach EBS volume, storage, okay, and you access it from internet, there will be data transmission, okay, from EC2 instance to internet, internet to your server, for that internet access, separate charges will be there. Okay, anyhow, there will be smaller prices will be applied. So you can scroll down. So you can see if you are running on M5D and 4X large, which coming with 64 GB RAM, 16 CPU cores, it's going to cost $1.82. Yes, per hour. Like i3 and metal, and we see it's coming with 768 GB RAM, 96 CPU cores, about $15.26. Like, then go with like a Red Hat, sorry, this is a Windows Server core with containers. So means it comes with pre-installed container. So if we see the software price, zero. Like if you go with Red Hat Enterprise Linux 7, and we see the information. Okay, software price is nothing. There is EC2 instance. And if you scroll down, so you can get instruction. See, usage instruction. So it says if you want some instructions, you can go and navigate to this particular site. It's pointing to Red Hat official site. And for support information, so you can refer this thing. Okay, about some license terms, this link. Okay, if you look at like a open VPN, you have Splunk Enterprise. Let me open it in another tab. Like 10 microchip, deep security as a service, like VM series next generation firewall. This is Planck Enterprise. Details about the product and it says zero dollar because it's providing bring your own license. If you already purchased the Splunk Enterprise, you can go with this option. Okay, there are other methods also available, like without bring your own license. Like we go to like we have some 10 micro deep security as a service. Okay, that's uh, some security product. We can see pricing over here. We see any micro, small, medium ECD instance is about 0 0.01 cents per hour. Like for 
any large EC2 instance into 0 0.03 cents per hour. And you can scroll down. So for, what is this? This one has software as service because they're providing some security software. And for help, you can navigate to this particular links. Uh, sir, one query uh, yeah. related to this. Uh, so uh, I understood uh, on uh, they are charging per hour basis, but so in our free account, right, it's 750 hours is applicable. So can we deploy any image for 750 hours and uh, that will work? How how that? Set? No, whichever shows as free tire while selecting MI, it shows is it falls under free tire or not. Okay, so for what when you were selecting, there was a green icon which yeah. was free when I was select AMI, so you can mm. see the icon with free tag. When you are selecting instance type, you see icon as free tag. Mm -hmm. so wherever you see free tag icon, that is that falls under free tag. Okay, so I uh, rest for example, you deployed was not a free tag, so that will be charged basically, right? No, I think I selected both free tag, but uh, I selected OS as free tag. Mm -hmm. I am not sure. That yeah, Windows one was not free tire, if I'm yeah, wondering. then it will be charged. Oh. Yeah. Okay. okay. Now if you look at like a VM series next generation firewall, it's coming with bring your own license. There will be no software charge, but there will be hardware charge. So we see software charge zero, but we see easy to pricing will be there. But it is bring your own license. You can uh, search like say follow all to. Like hit return button. We say Palo Alto Networks Panorama. And this is a bring your own license. This is something firewall bundle to. If we click on this panorama and we see the pricing over here. Okay, I think the zero dollar they're charging for software, but there is hardware price. And we can see the usage instruction. So click on it. So guidance available from here. Let's say maybe you can try for like some ASAP firewall. Okay, that is Cisco Adaptive Security Virtual Appliance. This is standard package and bring your own license. Okay, this one, if you go with this AMI, there will be no license charge. If you go with this AMI, okay, there will be license charge will be there. And we see here, See the pricing, it included software pricing as well as hardware pricing. And if you go with the usage instruction and you see it gives login information. So when you are making SSS to this ASC, username will be admin. And you make use of that private key as part of the authentication process. So anytime you want to get to know how you can log on on those particular instances launched using a particular AMI, you can get those information from AWS Marketplace. Otherwise, when you are launching that instance, it's going to give you information like how you can make login. Like when you are launching instance, it gives all required instructions. Like for example, let's say maybe going to launch AC. Let's filter for AMI. We see two results from AWS Marketplace, which is AC. You can go with like select. And we say many products are available under free tier. You can get information from AWS market. Please see, uh, free trial, the one instance of this product valid for five days. Later on, we can see the prices. And it also shows which instances you can use to run that thing. Because see, here we are not listing like small micro those things because those are not basic hardware, okay, to run this ASF firewall. And you can see you, Additional details in AWS Marketplace. That's going to take you to AWS Marketplace. And we see here usage instruction. Like you make use of username as admin and that private key for authentication process. Okay, so most of the EC2 instance you launch in AWS Cloud, they are available in 10 minutes. Maximum it may take 10 minutes. If launching like Linux server that are available in two minutes, like launching Windows server that may take like four or five minutes. If you're launching some firewall 
or some load balancer, it may take maximum 10 minutes. So one more uh, yeah. So if we now we have launched the instance and then we shut down, will the uh, charges will be applicable or shut down? Whenever instance help? is shut down, mm -hmm. for instance, you will be not charged. Mm -hmm. If the software is there, if it is under license, for license, there will be charged. Okay, and if you are using some additional public IP address, there will be charged. As you see, you attached some EBS storage, there will be charge for storage per month. Okay. 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 For storage, so, they charge per month per GBBS. Okay. Storage is charged, uh, but instance uh, will not be charged. That's yeah, EC2 mean. instance hardware will be not charged. Okay. And uh, okay. Yeah, got it. Thanks. Okay, so so different type of EC2 instance type, like general purpose thing like small servers, so which comes with low cost, provides a balance of compute, memory, networking. Use case when you want to host like small web servers, some microservice, normal small database, compute optimized instance type. Like if your application requires more CPU cycle, then you can go for compute optimized. Like when you want high performance web server, gaming server, machine learning server. Next, you have memory optimized instance type. Okay, that's for more memory intensive application like high performance DB server, big data, SAP, data warehouse. And you have accelerated computing, means whichever application requires more graphical processing. Next, you have storage optimized. Okay, which, which if your application requires a lot of read write operation, then you can go for storage optimization. So these are the instance types. So you can say AWS EC2 instance types. And there you see the categories. Yeah, general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized. You can go to each category. You can see different models, different instance types. Like we see T2, T3, T3, A1, M5, M5, MN, before that M4, M6G. So these are things, different systems, models comes with a different capacity. If you see T2, we have like T2 server, one CPU code and 0.5 GB RAM. Storage EBS, network performance low. Okay, if you go down, you can see like a T2 X notch, four CPU cores, 50, that CPU credits by Howard, that's provided by Gen Hypervisor, you get 16 GB RAM. And storage is EBS and this moderate. And you select different category, different power. You go with the T3. This is next generation of T2. So you can see general details like bustable CPU, governed by CPU credits, and also comes with something AWS Netro system. I will explain about Netro system later on. And we see T3 Nano, two CPU cores, 0.5 GB. See, compared to T2, T3, in T3, we are getting more CPU, but same amount of RAM. And if you go with like A1 series, we see A1 medium, A1 large, and we see one CPU core, two GB RAM, network performance up to 10 GBPS. If you go to compute optimizer, we see C4, C5, C5 and series. So it comes with a different feature. See the C4 coming with like high frequency Intel Geon, E5 something. See C4 X C4 large, two CPU cores, three and up GB RAM. EBS performance, exactly 500 megabytes per second. And network performance, it's a moderate. And memory optimized, accelerated computing. So these are the different system models. Okay, let's say maybe your application requires a lot of GPU power, graphical processing board. You can go to accelerated computing, you can go with choice. Let's say do you want G3, you can try G3. Let's say maybe you are thinking G3 instance type is fine, like G316X large, coming with four graphical graphics card, 64 normal CPUs, 488 GB. Let's say you thought this will be fine for your application. Okay, you can select this instance run. Maybe you are seeing whatever available graphics card, memory, CPU power is not enough. No problem, you shift your application to next generation, like G4. Okay, maybe you are thinking that 
the model which is like g Nix large is providing a um, lot of resources okay maybe your application does not require that much of resource you can shift your application to g3 8x watch okay for examination purpose you no need to remember all these things but you remember categories general purpose computer optimizer memory optimizer accelerated computing storage optimizer and also consider increments like g3x x launch g3 4x launch it is powerful than g3x launch okay like that so an exam question will be like that okay so like exam okay he may say like um, the application requires a lot of graphical processing so which instance type you suggest you may get option like g3x launch you get like a something r5 launch something so which option you select the g series or p series okay like that. so you don't need to remember each instance type model provided over here just remember the categories when you go with the general purpose there we have like t series m series computer optimizer which are c series like c4 c5 c5 and when you go for memory optimizer we have r x extreme memory high z option accelerated computing p i g f series and storage optimizer which comes with i d and h series <laughs> this one just says how you calculate a instance performance instance features measuring instant performance okay general information okay not any instance types Now let's have a look at Tenancy. So Tenancy represents where your server running. In a dedicated infrastructure, means on dedicated server, means on a dedicated physical server or on shared physical server. So there are the three, three types of Tenancy. Shared Tenancy, dedicated instance, and dedicated host. So in case shared Tenancy, Let's say there are two physical servers. Let's say this is the physical server. Okay. Let's say this is the host box. A physical server. Okay. This physical server will contain EC2 instances belongs to different customers. Let's say this is the EC2 instance belongs to customer one, and this is EC2 instance may belongs to customer two. Means that physical host box contains EC2 instances belongs to different customers. Okay, you no need to worry about isolation. There is no communication between C1 and C2. How resources are isolated? Using VPC. Okay, the next thing, dedicated tenancy. In dedicated tenancy, let's say this is the host box. This dedicated tenancy option is going to place your EC2 instance on a dedicated host box. When you are launching EC2 instance, and you say dedicated instance okay let's say this is a customer one okay let's say instance type is da dedicated instance okay this dedicated instance place it on dedicated host box this dedicated instance place it on dedicated host next time you're launching any ec2 instance normally and you selected shared tenancy if there is any free space available on the physical box your customer one instance again can be placed on that host box understand you get a dedicated host for your instance belongs to customer one if there is any free space available if you are launching a new ec2 instance by but select a shared tenancy that may be placed on that host box okay that dedicated host may share hardware with other instance okay but not other dedicated instance launched by you other instance launched by you by selecting shared tenancy now next coming to dedicated host in this case you get dedicated host box for you 
you get dedicated host. But what is the difference between dedicated instance and dedicated host? In case dedicated host, you have full control over this host box. Let's say maybe you purchased a large host box. In that host box, you may run single large EC2 instance. You can launch a large EC2 instance and you can say it is a large. Or you can put multiple small instances in that host box. You can say small one server, small two server, small three server, small four server. Means you have more control over that host box. You can put a big large EC2 instance on that host box or you can put multiple small instances in that host box. Okay, that is different. Okay, so what is the pricing? In case shared, normal pricing will be there. But when you go for dedicated instance, you'll be paying additionally $2 plus whatever the instance price. In case you go for dedicated host, you'll be paying for that host box based on whatever the price of that host box. Now, which one to choose? Performance wise, you can choose anything, no problem. Shared, dedicated instance, dedicated host. You get whatever they say. They said 2 GB RAM, 4 CPU cores, you get it. You consider the tenancy when license matters, when you want more confidentiality. Okay. Okay. And let's have a look at shared tenancy, some behavior. Let's say this is a C1 instance running on the physical host box. When you restart this C1 instance or shut down and start that C1 instance, your C1 instance may be placed on same host box or may be placed on different host box. Like as long as your instance running on host box, it will be there. If you restart or you shut down and start, it may be placed on same host box or may be placed on another host box. Okay, means your instance hardware may change. Let's say you are running some commercial application inside the C1 that bound to hardware license, means that allows you to run on single hardware. When you reboot or stop and start, your hardware will change, right? Then your commercial application will think duplicate license. In that kind of scenario, you can go with dedicated instance option. You get dedicated box or you can go with dedicated host. But dedicated host is costlier than dedicated instance. But what in case of dedicated host, you get more control over that host box. You can specify how instances can be placed within that host box. Understand. Okay, either you go with the dedicated instance or dedicated host, the host box will contain your instances only. So means you can think, let's say you want to run some sensitive service like banking site, you can go with the dedicated option. Understand. Either go with the dedicated instance or dedicated host. So that's what represents the tenancy. Tenancy represents how your servers placed in dedicated environment, means on dedicated host box or shared host box. What is meant by host box here? It's nothing but physical server, right? So while creating VPC, we had two options. Okay, the tenancy option is there, default and dedicated. You can go with the de uh, default. You can uh, make use of any tenancy, shared, dedicated, dedicated host. Or you can set as dedicated tenancy while creating VPs. That means anytime you launch EC2 instance, you get dedicated tenancy. Or you can create your VPC using default tenancy. While launching EC2 instance, you can specify type of tenancy you want. Like when you are launching instance, like for example, I said Amazon Linux OS. Let's go with any hardware. And here we have the tenancy. Shared tenancy, dedicated tenancy, and dedicated host. But when you go with shared, your server placed on some shared host box. When you go for dedicated, a dedicated host automatically created. But when you go for dedicated host, first of all, you have to purchase dedicated host box. Before you select Nancy as dedicated host, you have to purchase dedicated host box. You can do that from console, go to EC2 console, and you see dedicated host. Say allocate a host and select which one you want, like some M5. 
okay instance family like m5 large or extra large like we see four cpu cores 8 gb 16 gb ram so we can place like multiple micro servers or nano servers in, in which data center and then how many servers you want and allocate host once you purchase it it's yours when you are launching ec2 instance you select purchase a dedicated host box next pricing option for ec2 we have three pricing on demand pricing result pricing spot pricing on demand pricing means a fixed rate by hour okay fixed rate by hour so when you can make use of this pricing when you are you when you have no commitment you are not sure how long you are going to run the server you may be planning to run server for one month two months but you want to make sure your server will never shut down then you go with on demand pricing okay there will be no upfront payment or long term commitment so suitable for like short term spiky unpredictable workload now i launched two instances i didn't select any pricing so that is on demand pricing or you can go with rigid instance pricing let's say you are you are sure you are going to run that server for longer time like one year two year three year then you can purchase that server as rigid instance when you purchase it as a reservation you get up to 75 discount means up to 75 percent discount okay so so when you want rigid instance pricing when you are sure you are going to run that server for longer time like you want to run application with a steady state with predictable usage okay then you can purchase it as rigid instance again there are options like standard rigid instance you get up to 75 percent discount convertible rigid instance up to 54 discount and scheduled rigid instance somewhat discount standard rigid instance means let's say you selected m4 last server and susi linux operating system for one year but anytime in that mid of one year anytime you want to change instance type or os you can't you are running m4 you will be running m4 you are running susi linux you will be running susi linux okay anytime you want to change hardware means ec2 instance type os you can't change but when you go with convertible rigid instance you can change like you don't want m4 you want to scale to m5 you don't want to see one rhf you can switch to rhf but we see the discount is reducing 54 scheduled rigid instance means you purchase and reserve but you spin the server in scheduled time like i'll end up the like a daily evening or weekends or month ends like that you get somewhat discount the third option you have spot instance okay because as AWS having large pull up hardware. So all servers will be not utilizing by customers. So there are a lot of hosts remaining idle. So what AWS will try to do, it will try to sell them with lower price. They give their minimum small quotation and you give your maximum quotation and you start that server. As long as that price do not cross your maximum quotation, server will be up and running. Okay, the pricing may change. If demand occurs, what AWS will try to do, it will try to increase their minimum quotation. If their quotation goes beyond your maximum quotation, you get two minutes notification and your server will be terminated. Okay, like when you want to run like a, a big workload, okay, and like say you have want to process large amount of data, but a small time, like two hours, five hours, but you are not having budget to launch large servers, okay, using on demand pricing. In that case, you can go with spot instance. So when you are launching instance, so there you have option, like when you go with the launch instance, for example, let's imagine Linux, configure instance details, you can see, you miss spot instance pricing. See, this is, they're giving minimum quotation in those hour of the You can give your maximum quotation here and launch it. As long as their minimum quotation does not cross your maximum quotation, your instance will be up and running. Or you can purchase spot instance from EC2 console. You go to spot request. You request spot instance. Here you have. Like if you want to make sure you want to run that spot instance server for defined users, like one to six hours, you can go with this one. 
like I want to exactly run that server for four hours without any interruption. Okay, there may be some change in their minimum quotation. Okay, compared to normal quotation. You just select what voice you want. You can search for AMI from marketplace. Let's say, for example, you want to run like Ubuntu and you select instance type. Let's say, for example, C3 large. So now it's going to ask where you are going to place it. Like you select all up to zone 1A example and subnet you select and select whichever key pair you want, how many you want and launch it. Okay, so these are the two methods you can follow to purchase a spot instance. If you want to purchase rigid instance, go to rigid instance. Here you go, purchase rigid instance. Select OS you want, let's say for example, you want SUSI, the tenancy, default or dedicated tenancy, and you go offering class like convertible rigid instance, standard rigid instance, an instance type, for example, let's say M5X large term, one to 12 months plan, 12 months to 36 month plan. And you can go with no upfront payment, you get the discount. You can go with partial upfront payment, you get good discount, but you need to pay some advance. You can go with all upfront payment, means you pay everything in advance, you get very good discount. Okay, then you can click on search for the availability. There it is. So for 12 months, effective rate $1.105, upfront price $9,678. Once you are fine, so click on add to cart. Once purchased, you can launch it. That's it. So when it's launched, so you can see in the Visual Instance folder. Okay, so that is how you can purchase instance. On demand pricing without specifying any option, spot instance pricing, and you have reserved instance pricing. And uh, you have something capacity reservation. Okay, let's say maybe you are running a big company. Sometimes your workload become high. You may be using some auto scaling to auto scale servers. Maybe the char maybe the time you may not get ec2 instance available from aws data center so as a reservation you can purchase capacity from aws for that you can make use of create capacity reservation you specify what type of instance and what os how many you want so these are like purchase in advance when demand occurs means whenever a load on your application rises Okay, if there is the ch chances you may be not get a sorry EC2 instances from cloud, you have already purchased it as capacity. But even you purchase it as a capacity reservation in advance, there will be pricing. Right? Okay, let's summarize what we have created. We have not done with our EC2, still we have to do. Okay, as we started with our VPC section, we defined at a VPC regional level, then we defined at subnets for our up to zone. And we also understood what is VPC router. VPC router, it's completely managed by AWS and it is uh, it is sitting at border of VPC and it provides communication means reachability between all the subnets and internet gateway which provides internet connectivity but we provide routes using routing table. You understood EC2. This is the service allows you to create a virtual server in the cloud and you also understood what is AMI. This is source of software and you also understood AWS marketplace. Okay, so where you can find information regarding software, hardware, and related pricing. And you also understood key pair. In case RDP, we use private key to decrypt the password. In case SSH, we use private key as part of the authentication. Okay, so we call them as EC2 key pair. Okay, that depends on PK, public key, private key. Okay, so next thing. What did we cover? Security group, that's a virtual fi firewall per host level. 
Okay, but anyhow, more about security group, we do cover in VPC section. And one more thing here. So we have two servers running. For Windows, I have provided public IP address automatically. For Linux server, I provided public IP address manually. Is there any difference? As I provided public IP address automatically for Microsoft server, whenever it reboots, the public IP address will change. For, but for Linux server, I provided public IP address manually. It will be stable. I can remove the public IP which is assigned to Red Hat server. I can assign that public IP address to any other machine. If you purchase it, pub, okay, if you purchase it public IP address manually, you have control over it. You can remove that IP address from that Red Hat server. You can attach it to another machine. So whichever public IP address you purchase it manually, call it as elastic IPs. See, it's showing how many public IP addresses right now I have, only one. But actually, how many public IP addresses right now I have? Two. One for Microsoft, auto assigned, one for Red Hat, which is manually assigned. Elastic IP is nothing but public IP address, which is static public IP address. Once you release your public IP address, it's gone. It's not yours. But let's say your organization already purchased public IP address. Okay, you are not utilizing. You can upload them to a particular region and you can assign those public IP address to your EC2 instances. So that is elastic IP. Then you understood instance types. You have instance type like general purpose server and you have memory optimizer and compute optimizer and GPU optimizer, okay, which is accelerate computing and you have storage optimizer. So remember those instance categories and the next, the tenancy. Okay, so you have default tenancy or shared tenancy. Okay, means your instance placed on a shared host and you have dedicated instance means your instance will be running on dedicated host. But the dedicated host may contain other instance launched as shared tenancy by your account only. And you have dedicated host, means you have control over that host box. You can place a big server in that host box, you can place multiple small servers in that host box until you consume complete CPU cores and memory. And next we have pricing option. The pricing we have on demand, a fixed rate by hour or they charge per minute basis like for Linux operating system, but you have no discount, but your server will be always running. And the next pricing you have, reserved instance. Okay, you get the discount. Servers will be running as long as you release them. But one thing, once you purchase server as reservation, let's say you purchase it for one year, you don't want after six months or three months. Okay, you can release it for sale. Okay, but you will be paying for it until somebody purchases same server. Okay, let's say you released it, nobody purchased that religious server, you will still paying for that. If somebody purchases same server, means another account holder, you no longer need to pay. And you have spot instance where AWS provides their minimum quotation, you provide your maximum quotation. If their minimum quotation reaches by your maximum quotation, you get two minutes notification and your instance will be terminated. So when, when do you spot instance? Like when you are planning to run large server, but small not time, like two hours, five hours, six hours, instead of going with on-demand pricing, instead of going with the rigid instance pricing, where you want to run server for longer time. You maybe want to run a big server for short time. In that case, you can go with spot instance. Anything else? That's it, right? Yeah. Okay, fine. Let's go terminate the EC2 instances. We launch it. So whichever instance falls under free tag, you can keep it running. So I don't require these two instances. Let's go terminate them. So we go to actions and we say instance state. 
and terminate them. And we have option like I can say release that elastic IP address that associated to our Red Hat server. Backup, mm -hmm. back whatever you want. You want entire server, backup entire server. Now you want particular EBS volume, backup that should be. So once instance terminated, it's not reversible. Once you delete any storage, it's not reversible. Unless you make another copy or unless you make backup. We see about backup when we go for two years. Okay, in next session, we continue with our EC2. Then we talk about some performance regarding EC2. Okay, later on virtualization time. And we also cover like creating custom EMI, what is the purpose of custom EMI. Then we see about some pricing, the last basic pricing. Then we see limitation, like how many instances you can launch, how you can increase, okay, number of instances if you want more. Okay, by default, you can launch like 20 instances, later on all the functions. Okay, if you want to launch more than 20, what is the process that you can follow? Once done with that, we go with TV. Once done with that, we go with technical. Okay, anyhow, within EC2 control, we have different topics. Right now, we are seeing about EC2 instance. But within EC2 control itself, we have many topics. We have like a load balancer, a separate topic. And we have auto scaling and subject topic. We have EBS, that one also has subject And we see instance terminated, that's very quiet, but class is also released. Okay, so that's it for this session. So let me know if you have any questions. Gracias.